Yo, what's good YouTube? I'm back with another reaction video and we back with the part two of the 1992 Dream Team documentary, man. Appreciate all love and support, y'all. Yeah, this documentary is crazy, man. We're here with this part two, though, man. Appreciate all love and support. Shout out to y'all. Shout out to y'all. Subscribe if you're new. Hit that like button and let's get straight into it, man. Got an instrumental mixtape dropping June 23rd. So if you want to hear me make beats, man, look on June 23rd. It'll be dropping on this channel. Be dropping around a lot of social media platforms. But uh, yeah, let's get it, man. Let's get straight into this video. The United States men's basketball team landed in Barcelona for the Olympics on July 24th, 1992. In store was an experience unlike anything they or the sports world had ever seen. The plane landing in Barcelona, helicopters flying over it. We're thinking, wow, what is all the commotion? What happened? And then we figured out they were there for us. <laughs> That was the first time that we realized how popular and how enormous this thing was. I was like, guys, if we lose, it's gonna be like the biggest upset in sports history. Barkley was right. There was no margin for error. A reality the rest of the team openly accepted in their first press conference in Spain. I know I'm really afraid to fail because I can't go back home if, if we don't win the goal. Even though from a little small place in Summerfield, those 250 people there said, we, I can't come back. Barkley, meanwhile, handled an endless barrage of questions as only he could. How did you feel in 1972 when the Soviet Union beat the United States in that wild game? Well, I had just flunked my entrance exam in the kindergarten, so I really, that was the only thing. So. You know, everybody that has ever been in front of a camera, we tend to not say certain things. Why don't they just take their ass whipping like people and go home? <laughs> Barkley says things that we would think about and never say. We're going to have a li little revenge in our hearts for 72 and 88. David, well, he can't say that because he's a Christian. But uh... <laughs> he said, man, you don't talk honestly enough to the media. You need to tell them what you're really thinking. I said, Charles, you talk too much to the media. You need to stop telling them everything you're thinking. And when Charles was asked about the team's first opponent, his prediction was as honest as ever. I don't know anything about Angola, but Angola's in trouble, I think. Just moments ago, the Dream Team boarded the bus outside their hotel along the Rambles. They are heading for their first matchup in Barcelona with the Angolans. I can remember the first game, the real game, when we came out of the locker room and, and stepped on the court. And I finally said to myself, was, I can't believe this. I'm here. At that point, we were in serious Olympic mode. This actually may be the biggest mismatch of the entire Olympics. Barkley off a beautiful speed from Mullen. And he drew the foul. Magic right to the The U.S. with a 46 to 1 run. 46 to 1. It was just a tremendous atmosphere because there was an appreciation for how great the U.S. players were. After the first half, Barkley's pregame prediction appeared dead on. But in the second, Charles found some trouble. Any of the players in Angola who play against South Barkley, they told us there's no a, a, a kid, a fat boy, is a if many aggressive in the pain. Rebound Barkley. Rebound Barkley. And he's fouled and shot David Dia. Well, Charles getting a bit aggressive. I thought they were playing dirty. And, uh, and I told old boy, I don't, I don't even know if he understood, but I said, hey, man, ease up on the elbow. Barkley from Pippen. I let it go twice. You can see the frustration with Barkley. And the next time, I just cracked it. Barkley from Pippen. And a technical foul has been called on Barkley. To his dying day, Charles claims the guy elbowed him three times. I said, Charles, you know, you're full of crap. No, it's not true. I didn't uh, have a Barkley before the incident. 
People always say, turn the other cheek. If you turn the other cheek, I'm going to hit you another cheek, too. I thought, what are you doing, Charles? <laughs> the guy is half your size. But you know, Charles was an equal opportunity abuser. Erlande Codembra did not think it was a, uh, a friendly elbow. That's the same guy that just asked you for an autograph, Charles. I mean, you think he's not intimidated? I think he's acting like a bully. But maybe it's, uh, it's from his personality. The United States has defeated Angola by the score of 116 to 48. Oh, my. Yo, whoa, whoa. <laughs> yo, that is crazy, bro. What? Yo, that's crazy. They got killed. They got murdered, man. The game may have ended in a rout, but afterwards, the result was overshadowed by the controversy. Welch with the elbow. Well, he hit me, I hit him. That's the way it is. Charles made you look like the ugly Americans, which we were trying not to do. We said to Charles, look, man, you're a reflection of all of us. So if you do it, they're not going to write the article that Charles Barkley did. They're going to say the dream team. Barkley had stained a dream debut for the Americans. But in their next game against Croatia, Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan grabbed the spotlight. With the focus on their matchup, with one of Europe's best players, Tony Kukoc. Major storyline that carries into this game involves Tony Kukoc, second round pick of the Chicago Bulls back in 1989. The Bulls made a strong push to sign him last season. At that time, general managers in the league were trying to come up with gems, you know, make their discoveries overseas. And Kraus thought this guy could play in the NBA. While Jordan and Pippen had been winning back-to-back -back titles, Chicago GM Jerry Krause had been publicly wooing Kukoc to join the Bulls. Krause was recruiting this guy and was talking how great he was. You know, that's like a, a father who has all his kids and now he sees another kid that he loves more than he loves his own. So we were not playing against Tony Kukoc. We were playing against Jerry Krause in a Croatian uniform. But unfortunately for the real Tony Kukoc, he was now the target of the world's two best defensive players. They were debating who was going to guard him. No, 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 I got it. No, 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 I got it. I'm looking at Michael and Scotty, and they're ready for, like, blood. Like, man. We knew the world was going to be watching. We knew everyone wanted to see what Tony Kukoc was like, and we were going to give him the worst experience he ever had on the basketball court. Pippen drew the initial assignment of shadowing Kukoc and harassed the Croatian from the opening whistle. It was hard to run across the half court without a ball. And, and uh, with the ball, it was just, here, somebody else get it. Tony definitely wasn't getting a shot up, and he wasn't going to score. Kukak is nothing for four, and he's contributed nothing. We wanted to go guard him on the bench. Kukak is called for the offensive foul, and the pressure continues. And after Pippen wore Kukoc down, it was Jordan's turn. Kukoc, stolen by Jordan. He reads it better than anyone. Slammed up. Them dudes were all over him. Jordan rejected Kukoc. Here's a three on two. Pippen. I had questions from my teammates during the game, like, what is going on? What, do you not see that they're really trying to uh, get you off the court? And I'm like, so what? I guess that's, that's how NBA game is played. Pippen, Jordan, and the Americans cruise to another victory. This one by 38 points. But the domination had its detractors. This team of All-Stars is almost too good. Is it a positive or a negative? The question was now being asked, was the dream team too great for its own good? This team of all-stars is almost too good. Some think that we should go back to the collegians. It's been too easy. I think then we ought to ban the uh, African runners from the 10,000 meters because they make it look so easy as well. <laughs> uh, this is about our best, and this is wonderful for the sport of basketball. 
Irvin, uh, there's been some comments that the Dream Team is getting all the attention and there seems to be some resentment about it. Have you heard about it and do you have any feelings about it? Uh, basically, you know, we haven't heard about it. We're just here to do our job. The media may have been looking for signs of a backlash, but in Barcelona and in the world beyond, the embrace of the Dream Team was universal. You had a root gonna stand out and root against Picasso? I mean, I mean, oh, seriously. They rooted for genius at work. I kept thinking that the attention would dissipate. They're gonna play the first game. They're gonna win by 60. People are gonna go back and watch Trek. Jordan in transition with the slam to give Team USA a 60-point lead. It didn't. It kept building and building and building. The U.S. with another trouncing, 127-83, 127 points. Workers were trying to get autographs. The security people were trying to get autographs. All the athletes were standing on side like a parade. What a ball fake by Scotty Pippen. It is a 58-point lead. People perceived us as being superheroes. Man, it's always somebody. It's always somebody or people that's just trying to take something good away, man. I hate people like that, bro. Like, come on, just let them be great, man. I hate shit like that, bro. This was a blowout by the U.S. Pats Olympic team. The guy on the bench is taking pictures, and I said, "Wow." We are having an effect over here. Wrap around past the Greco. Another easy victory in this their fifth game of the Olympics. It was as if uh, the president of the United States was uh, in the midst of a, a caravan that was going through the streets. It was like the Beatles, where there's thousands and thousands of people waiting all the time. That was the most exhilarating 15 seconds of my life. We're like, wow, this is amazing. No one member of the Dream Team reveled in the Olympic experience more than Charles Barkley. After throwing the controversial elbow against Angola, Barkley had emerged as the team's most visible player. Everybody always had the same question. How much of a, an ass is Charles Barkley? Hey, Jack, when am I going to be on the cover of Sports Illustrated for this stuff? I should be on the Dream Team cover. And then every time you'd go spend time with him, you know, you'd just realize that he was the most enjoyable act, not only in all of sports, but possibly in all of pop culture. Sometimes I dream <laughs> that he is me. I just want to be like Chuck, I mean Mike. Right away, I told my editors, I said, well, the number one angle here is what is Charles doing? And if you wanted the answer to that question, all you had to do was follow the crowds. They're like, we don't want you guys out and about because we don't know how safe it is. And I'm like, dude, I'm at the Olympic. I'm not going to stay in my room the whole time. So Barkley strolled Los Ramblas, a man of the people if ever there was one. Man, I walked up and down the Ramblas every night, and the people were fantastic. They all wanted autographs and wanted to take pictures. We could be inside the hotel. Soon we heard the big roar. <laughs> we said, there go Charles. <laughs> so Charles would be walking, and then thousands would be following him everywhere he went. You know, he was the Pied Piper. Charles would go over to the village and like find the Angolan players and hang out along the Ramblas at night. He was the most memorable person of the 1992 Olympics. I just saw this touch he had. I don't think anybody else in the world could have done it beside Charles Barkley. At the end of the day, he was America's best ambassador. Damn, and I had no clue either, yo. I had no clue that Charles Barkley. See, that's why I'm glad I did these things, man, because I had no clue. I knew about the Dream Team, of course, but I just never knew Charles Barkley. Like, out of all of them, Charles Barkley would be the one. Like, I watch him on TNT when they had the basketball on. All Like, I never knew Charles Barkley was the one. Now I know. That's crazy. Barkley was celebrated for experiencing the Olympics on his own terms. More quietly, one of his teammates found a way to do the same. We had the motorcycle escorts and we bust through traffic like Dick Tracy. But this one day we got stuck in traffic and we're just sitting there and sitting there and sitting there. Finally I said, that's it. Let's go. 
Anybody wants to go with me, I'm heading. He get off the bus and his family met him. He started walking right through the middle of everybody and nobody noticed him. I'm still on the bus, seeing him walk down the street and I'm saying to myself, I would give anything to do what he just did. See guys, this is called the rhombus. See all the footprints? All right. So the last rhombus, it's like Times Square or something. There's just so many people walking. I'm six feet one, I'm about the average size of everybody else on that little walk. So I'm walking with my family and I have the camera and nobody's noticing. You think it's the sunglasses that's fooling them? Must be. Hi. You're from America? Yeah. Right. Whereabouts? Uh, Whereabouts? Massachusetts. Massachusetts. You been watching the Dream Team at all? Yeah. They're pretty good, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. No attention whatsoever. Finally, we ran across this lady who had the Dream Team and all the pictures on her T-shirt. Hi. Hi. Are you an American? Of course. You look wonderful. Why, thank you. She started speaking real excitedly about each of the players. And I said, have you had a chance to meet anyone? Yeah. Charles Barkley the other night. Did you? He's a hell of a player. See, you got all the players right there on your yeah. shirt. Is Charles the only one you've ever seen? The only one I've ever met. Hey, guys, do you know any of those guys on there? I think my oldest son, Houston, ruined the surprise. That's my dad. Your dad? That's your dad? Too bad he's not here. Oh. You play on I do, yeah. Who is that guy? Oh, no. <laughs> I can't go anywhere without being bugged. <laughs> Really not much different from Michael Jordan walking through here. For the players, surreal experiences had become the norm. But even more memorable were the unlikely friendships developing behind the curtain. It was a unique mix. You know, Larry Bird and Patrick Ewan became like best friends. I got a white guy from Indiana, and I got a brother from Jamaica. Patrick said I could pick his money. It took me, <laughs> took me three minutes. Whenever y'all hear that and the streaming program that I use, that means I just got another sub. So appreciate you if you're watching this. Appreciate the sub, man. Yeah, man I get the chance to come back and start picking on mine. <laughs> took me one. <laughs> we were probably the two of the most unlikely people you thought that would be friends. But if you look, yeah, I kind of see, kind of see that. Do look like they kind of not, but yeah, that's it's always like that though. Sometimes you, the people you expect that it won't be will be. Not only Larry and I got to be great friends, but all of those guys got to be much better friends. We all enjoyed each other. We all enjoyed the ride. And we got a sense of each other as men. Then, when we got to the court, it made it even better. The Dream Team's chemistry turned out to be the hallmark of their success as the players closed in on what they came for. Their big margins of victory may have been a testament to their dominance, but numbers couldn't capture what made watching them so unforgettable. Guys played the best basketball you've ever seen in your life. It was literally like great poetry or great art. At times, you feel you're watching a performance, a concert rather than a basketball competition. This was fun. This was like, it's how basketball's supposed to be. And at the center of the fun was the team's biggest star, who had come to Barcelona at the peak of his powers and shown how much his popularity had exploded. I will say this one thing about Michael Jordan. I've been around other celebrities in my life. I've never seen people react like they do to him. People go crazy when they see him. In every corner of the world, there was someone who just wanted to see him. Please, Michael Jordan! No one had the sort of pull, the gravity that Michael Jordan had. Jordan had initially come to Barcelona reluctantly, but an early morning trip just before the gold medal game revealed how meaningful his Olympic experience had become. What time in the morning is it right now? 6.30, 6 quarters, quarter to 7, something like that. And I'm drinking coffee, so it's got to be a hurry. Can we go now? Where are you from? Albuquerque. Albuquerque, New Mexico. Big fan of yours. Everyone's a big fan of yours. 
Your name? George Hirsch. George, how you doing? I'm doing Michael George, nice to meet you. Last night, I hit my wall, man. Did you? I couldn't make a basket. What are you doing up so early? I do remember getting up early <laughs> to walk into the stadium. That is the thing that I remember the most about the Olympics. Olympic Stadium. Imagine all the athletes that's been here before us. It's amazing. What about Edward Moses? He won 122 consecutive races. I think everybody's got something to cherish. I think this is something that my kids are gonna love one day. The Dream Team squared off against Croatia again in the gold medal game, offering the world one more lasting impression of their supremacy. Barkley with the lead for Bonham. Behind the back, Drexler. Team USA came to send a message tonight. We wanted to win and we wanted to dominate, but how we did it, sharing the ball, including everybody, we did it as a true team. The U.S. has defeated Croatia 117 to 85, and they have won the gold here in Barcelona. Campeón olímpico y medalla de oro, el equipo de los Estados Unidos de América. There was never really any doubt the Dream Team would win gold in 1992. But as they walk back onto the court to get their medals, the moments still overwhelm them. You saw a lot of tears from players. It was a very proud moment for me because anytime you represent your country, you know, that's a prideful thing. Man, send chills down my spine. It was a reward that I had never felt like that I would ever achieve to do it on that stage with those group of guys. It's a memory I'll never forget. Nothing in my life has ever felt like standing on that podium. I was getting goosebumps. Every single time I heard the national anthem after that had a different significance to me. I knew what it really meant. As a young kid growing up, I used to watch Olympics on TV with my father, and uh, all he talked about was the Star Spangled Banner and, and the gold medal. It made him feel proud to be American. Being up on that podium that night and receiving it, my father, he'd been pretty proud. All those emotions just overcame me. I got to be one of the guys one more time for my country. I said, man, I'll never forget this moment. You know, if this is the end, this is how I wanted to go out. This group may well be the greatest team ever assembled in the history of team sports. But when the medal ceremony was over, another realization began to settle in. When I walked off, I remember thinking, that whole uh, dream has come to an end. The next season, every Olympian except Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. I ain't gonna lie, that team is stacked, bro. They got everybody in there, bro. They got Johnson, Barkley, Mullen, yo, Dick Drexel, Pippen, Bird, Matt, yo. This team is really stacked when you sit back and look and think about it, bro. No other, no, never gonna be another team like this, man, at all, bro. Would return to the NBA. Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen would win their third title against Charles Barkley and the Phoenix Suns on the way to six championships overall. The last three with Tony Kukoc. Eventually, other members of the team would also win titles. But each NBA player on the Dream Team would reach the Hall of Fame. Still, it's what they did together that summer that had the biggest impact on the game. 
an impact that continues to grow today. It really lifted basketball and it gave birth to international stars who had nothing to do with those games in 92, but who took so much from it. We made the game a worldwide game. You know, I talked to Tony Parker. I talked to Ginobili. I talked to Dirk Nowitzki. Those guys say their first love of basketball started with the Dream Team. And I'm really proud of that. The world can change a lot in 20 years. But there are moments in time you never forget, no matter how long it's been. No matter how much else has changed in your life since. 20 years later, they've all kept ties to the game in one way or another. And they all talk about the summer of 92, as if it happened just yesterday an experience still unlike any other in their remarkable basketball lives. I've never had more fun being around anybody. Everybody got along, there was no ego, we had fun. You know, clearly everybody reminds me I never won a championship. So that to me was like winning the championship, winning a gold medal and hanging out with these guys. The reward itself is really only a small part of the story. It's what the gold medal represents that will always tie these men together. This is like this fraternity. That's, that's pretty awesome. I don't think you're ever going to be able to get 11 Hall of Famers to play all at once, you know, um, on one team. That's, that's unheard of. <sighs> we go on the bus. <sighs> We come back, ah. walk out the hotel, ah. wave, ah. wave outside your window. Ah. I can't believe it, I lost it so much ago. I just saw my God. It changed sport as we know it. They showed the world how to play basketball. What other team can say that? I don't think we'll ever see anything like it again. It's an insult to compare anybody else to that team. Take a good look. Perhaps we'll never see a team this great again. No team will ever have that happen. Hasn't had that happen. And uh, that's the dream team. I didn't know he passed away, man. Damn, 2009, wow. R.I.P. to him, man. R.I.P. to Chuck, man. I had no clue at all. Damn. Damn. R.I.P. to him, man. Ninety-two gold medalists, Olympics. USA basketball, dream team. Original NBA. Hey, give me some of it. Woo, that was a good one right there, man. I'm glad I did this documentary, man. Ooh, this was good, bro. Oh, man, I got to find some more documentaries also. But this dream team, yo, there's no other team in life at all would ever, ever be this come to them. No, would never be another team. 11 Hall of Famers and that team was so stacked, bro. Just even seeing Jordan, Bird, and Magic is just like it didn't add everybody else, yo. Barkley and just, yo, man, that's crazy. But anyway, man. Appreciate all of the support, man. Appreciate y'all sticking through the, this documentary with me. Shout out to Doug Addict. 
for definitely telling me to do this video. I know I'm definitely doing it. We finally did it. But I appreciate all the support, man. You know, could keep it short and sweet. If you got some videos you want me to do, leave them in the comments down below. And, uh, yeah, that's about it. Got an instrumental mixtape dropping June 23rd. And, uh, yeah, man, that's about it, man. I'm out of this joint. I love y'all so much, man. Peace.